Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. In book two of his work on anger, Seneca is going to consider a number of objections that people in his own time were bringing forward. And I think that we see people even up to the present getting taken in by. These are lines of reasoning about anger that on the surface seem kind of plausible, but are actually, as Seneca is going to point out, quite mistaken. And they have to do with what we can translate as nobility. There's this term that's being used, which is not nobilitas, but generositas. Actually, it's being used as an adjective in this, generosus, you know, generosi. And it does have the sense of nobility. It comes from the word for, you know, one's birth, meaning the family that one is born into. And the idea here is that there's a kind of, you know, aristocratic status to anger. And I think that we do see this a lot, not just in Roman society, not just in ancient Greek society or through the Mediterranean and the Middle East in general, but in many, many other places as well. You could say that this is almost like a timeless problem in many different cultures. And so there's going to be three main objections that he is considering in book two, in particular, in chapters uh, uh, 15 and 16. One of them in uh, an entire chapter by itself. So let's look at the first one. He talks about the free peoples and as the examples of these, you know, it's typical sort of Roman and Greek stuff. We've got the Germans and we've got the Scythians. If you don't know who the Scythians are, they were a people who lived north of the Black Sea uh, in, you know, the, the area that was, con you know, rather unpopulated and uh, grassland and they rode horses and they fought and every once in a while they'd come down and raise some hell among the more you know civilized peoples to the south and they were viewed as being very uh, brave being very tough right the germans of course lots of different tribes of them the romans had to fight against them a number of times along with their their various allies you know so it could be romans and gauls against germans and seneca says people will say that these people are most disposed to anger iracundissimi right and i think it's important to pause there on that term because seneca earlier on in book one talks about iracundia as being the disposition right? The, you could call it motivational structure or habit that disposes a person to get angry much more easily, to not be in control of their anger. So he's saying that a lot of people will point out that there's entire societies, entire races of people who are like that. And Seneca says, all right, yeah, there's, there's something to this. This happens because naturally brave uh, people who have uh, a nature, a natura, and uh, it's sort of part of who they are in Genia, people who have a brave nature and a substantial nature, solidique, are going to be prone to anger if something doesn't happen. It doesn't mean that they're naturally going to just be angry all the time. It's when they're untrained, or as he's going to say a little bit later, unshaped. We human beings have the possibility of education, of discipline, of formation, 
of taking what it is that we're born with or have by virtue of our families and culture and reworking that in a deliberate way. And that's what's not happening, he thinks, among the so-called free peoples. He does also buy a little bit into what we can call a prevalent Goldilocks theory that the Greeks and Romans uh, rather self-servingly endorsed where you have you know, people who live in the north. Because of that, the irascible part of themselves is overdeveloped. They're dealing with the cold and you know, wild animals and living in, in difficult circumstances. And that, that's the too much, right? And then in the South with like the Egyptians and the Syrians and the Persians, eh, too, too weak, not angry enough, not, uh, you know, not riled up about things, too easy to, to rule. And then in the middle, you know, Again, rather self-servingly, the Romans, the Greeks, the people who are born to actually exercise rule because they have the right sort of composition. Now, you know, is there anything to this geographical or racial determinism? Probably not. But he is going to bring this up uh, as, as one of the explanations. And then he says, coming back to this training, certain traits are inborn only in better natures, like sturdy and prolific stands of trees that the earth bears. However uncultivated, a forest grows tall in fertile soil, right? And so he talks about naturally gallant characters, gallant meaning just, you know, brave, right? Uh, are wrathful. They, their hot, fiery nature contains nothing slight and delicate, but it needs to be, un, it needs to be shaped and formed, right? Uh, all the traits that arise only from the good of nature itself without skills guidance can go bad. And so without this training, this shaping, bravery or courage, fortitudo, this virtue, this very good trait, uh, is going to go bad and turn into recklessness and rashness. And anybody who's you know, read the Nicomachean Ethics recognizes this as sort of the vice that is opposed to the virtue of courage by having too much, too much confidence, not enough actual fear or prudence, right? So that's what's going to happen to these naturally or culturally angry people. And he throws in one other thing that's actually quite interesting here. One consideration. They're unable to rule is how it's translated, but we might translate this as organize and rule effectively, right? Imperare. They're, they're unable to have lasting power structures because they jockey for position with each other. They get too angry. They fight with each other. And he says that they're unable to command. Why? Because although they're not slavish, they're also too, as he says, fierce, fairy, right? Wild is another way of translating that and intractable, which is just a transliteration of intractabilis, right? Unable to be molded, to be shaped, to work with. And he says that um, uh, no one is able to rule who cannot also be ruled. They resist that, so they're not able to rule effectively. Again, it's something that comes from Aristotle discussed in the politics, right? Then he goes on to talk about animals. So we're going to leave behind examples of the tough guy cultures that people love to talk about and imitate and pretend to be. And we might even think about, you know, our own time and what this might apply to people uh, wanting to do the Maori haka, right? Uh, it's kind of silliness, right? Unless you, when, unless you understand it in its cultural context, you know, taking that on and pretending you're a tough guy, pretending to be one of the free people's it, probably not a good thing for you from Seneca's perspective. Um, we can say so, so much about others as well, those who worship the military and soldiers because they watch commercials about Marines doing crazy things on TV that they don't actually do in, in real combat. Um, so there's this cultural thing, and then we can talk about animals. This is also a cultural thing, right? Animals don't generally look at other animals and say, oh man, I should be like that. I'm a snake, but I should be like a bird, or I'm a raven, and I should be like that deer over there. No, we human beings are the ones who 
to some degree anthropomorphize animals and then say, let's be like that. Think about how many people, uh, you know, he's going to bring up lions. Think about how many people love to use the image of a lion, even for, by the way, stoicism, where the lion is not a good thing, right? They'll put it on their book. They'll put it on their website. They'll put it in their coaching program. And you're like, well, what, what's wrong with you? Don't you understand that the lion is not actually, in this respect, a good creature? Certainly not in terms of anger. But, you know, there's a lot of people out there who say animals that possess a lot of anger, uh, literally in, in whom there's a lot of anger, are considered the most noble, generosima, right? And so who does he talk about? Well, lions and wolves and other sorts of beasts of prey, right? And the stoic, you know, attitude towards that is those aren't the models to actually imitate, um, there's a couple different reasons for that. The first is, you're not a lion, you're not a wolf, you're not any of those things, you're a human being. You shouldn't be imitating the example, uh, the bad example of particular animals, right, just because they seem cool or something. And he says, um, you know, if you're going to imitate animals, why wouldn't you imitate better ones? Or instead, you know, when you have the universe and God, whom a human being alone of all animals comprehends, you can imitate God. <laughs> Don't imitate some brute beast and say, ooh, I'm cool, I'm great, I'm brave because I'm like the lion, you know, or the jaguar or pick whatever other animal, crocodile, you know, that you want to. And then he also points out, listen, not all the animals are served by being, you know, the tough guys of the animal kingdom. As a matter of fact, a lot of them are served by other things. He brings up the deer who is served by, you know, uh, fear and, and flight, right? Um, who else does he have, uh, you know, attack aids the hawk, flight the dove, right? So that's important to keep in mind. And then he asks a very funny question. So if you actually buy into this line of reasoning, are you saying that the more angry a predator is, the more generous, the more noble, the better an animal it is, an animal of its own kind? I mean, think about this just for a second. A lion that cannot get along with other lions because it's always getting angry is going to get kicked out of the pack. Even if it's a really tough lion, right? It's not going to rule forever. It's going to get older, and then the other male lions or the female lions are going to maul the crap out of it and send it packing, right? Uh, then we can say the same thing about others. There's sort of a healthy amount for that kind of animal of anger or drive or whatever it is. Seneca actually doesn't consider that anger anyway. And then there's a going beyond even for animals. The last one that he brings up is another thing that we often see. Well, at least the angry people, you know where you stand with them, right? They don't BS around. They don't conceal. They tell you what they think. A lot of people see that as a Good thing, obviously, until it's turned against them, right? Uh, and so he says, wrathful people are considered the most straightforward of all people. Now, straightforward is simplicissimi, right? The simple, the it's above board, you know exactly what you're getting. And uh, Seneca says, well, sure, but not per se, but rather by comparison to the deceitful and the tricky people right? They appear straightforward because they act without concealment. And the reason they act without concealment is because they can't even manage to conceal or rein in their passion of anger. And he says, should we really describe them as straightforward? Or is there a better term that we could use here? And he says, they're actually incautious. They don't think before they speak. They jump into situations without assessing the dangers involved because they're angry and they want to fight, right? And he says that this is the name, incautious, is the name that we give to foolishness, luxury, wastefulness, and all the devices deficient in cleverness, right? So there's a positive spin that's often given to anger by a lot of people, and Seneca is trying to attack that straight on and say, 
people who, you know, buy their constitution or their culture or their individual upbringing uh, are prone to anger, especially prone to anger, are not because of that more noble or generous or magnanimous or whatever you want to say. We shouldn't be imitating animals just because we think that they're cool and they inspire us. And angry people are not straightforward in the good sense of the term, but rather just saying their mind without really thinking it through or acting on it in many cases as well. So these are some important objections that we see uh, not only in his time, but in our own time and cultures. And Seneca has some really good answers for these.